Welcome back to Mises Weekends. I'm Jeff Deist, and our guest this weekend is someone we've spoken to before, L.U. Beltrao from Mises Institute Brazil. And he's a very important guy, not only in Brazilian libertarian circles, but in the worldwide Austrian movement. Now, if you've been following what's happening in Brazil, you know that the country is in a meltdown. They've had a stock market crash. They've had huge currency devaluation and inflation. And lately, the Brazilians have taken to the streets to protest for the removal of President Rousseff. And some of those protesters have been carrying signs and banners that say less Marx, more Mises. And this is something we'd sure like to see in street protests in the U.S., to put it mildly. L.U. and his compatriots at Mises Institute Brazil are behind these signs and behind much of the libertarian sentiment that is now starting to gather momentum in Brazil. So if you'd like to hear more about what's happening in Brazil, stay tuned for a great interview with our friend L.U. Beltrão. So great to talk to you and welcome back to Mises Weekends. Thank you very much, Chef. Well, there's so much going on in Brazil, so much to talk about. But before we talk about the country, tell us a little bit about what's happening with Mises Brazil. About two evenings ago, you just had a big celebration and an announcement. So uh, 500 people were there. So we want to know what's happening with our sister organization. Yeah, it was a great event, uh, Jeff. Uh, We wanted to gather uh, our supporters and let them know what are the ideas for the next few years. And we basically announced that we are revamping the site. It should go online within two months. Uh, it's a brand new design and, and brand new facility. So I think it's, uh, this is a very good development. And we announced uh, the um, Mises Summer School that we intend to run uh, beginning of next year uh, during four days in a um, in a secluded place in which you can then have all the team, all the professors, scholars of the Mises Brazil team, uh, together with about 30 uh, students. Uh, and that's uh, that's a new thing. We haven't had that. Uh, and finally, we announced the uh, first post-grad course in Austrian economics. We don't have that in Brazil. That's a, a brand new development. Uh, it, it will be a certified uh, Lato Senso specialization. Uh, to, uh, in, we are in partners with a, a university in Sao Paulo. And of course, we'll also have a solution for online uh, teaching as well, a separate course for that. That's that should come in the second semester of next year. So all of these are brand new things that uh, we are very excited about. Uh, we are we want uh, to come more and more closer to uh, teaching more people and uh, taking over a little bit of the place that we lost in the academia uh, from uh, several decades uh, before. And of course, you know that uh, the Brazilian academia is is. Uh, hegemonic in Marxism. Uh, it's not even uh, neoclassical Keynesianism, Keynesianism in Brazil, it's Marxism. Uh, so we want to get in and take over uh, some of the, the, the terrain that we've lost over the last uh, few decades. And also we had, uh, during that evening, Jeff, we had an announcement of uh, uh, the first uh, four people that we are honoring with a distinguished um, membership of Mises Brazil. We have had that, that in the bylaws for a long time, but would never use that. So we announced the four people that are receiving that honor, and the first one is Lou Rockwell. Uh, we are, as you know, uh, great admirers of everything that Lou has done for libertarianism, for the social sciences, and it's a great privilege to uh, give this honor to Lou as well as to uh, the three main scholars of Austrian economics in Brazil. The first one is Biratan Iori, which is our uh, academic vice president. Uh, Also, Fabio Barrieri, which is uh, the editor uh, of our our academic journal. And also Professor Anthony Miller, that you know well, because he's a scholar at the Mises Institute. And these are the four first uh, distinguished members of uh, Mises Brazil. Well, I have to say, for people who aren't as familiar, Mises Brazil has a huge influence. I mean, obviously, Brazil is a big country, 200 million people. But yet, when we see some of these recent street protests against Rousseff, um, you know, we see the signs that say, uh, less Marx, more Mises. And whenever we see this, we always figure that you have a hand in this. Yeah, it's true. Um, there are some um, 
some figures that may show a little bit of the influence we, we've been having. Uh, first one is that uh, we are, in terms of uh, online presence of social networks, multimedia, the number one think tank outside of the U.S. in the world. Uh, and that's uh, compiled by the Atlas Network that uh, among uh, about 500 uh, think tanks worldwide. So that's one thing. And, and the other thing I, we are used to talking about is that uh, if you run Google Trends that shows the interest in keywords and you compare Ludwig von Mises against John Maynard Keynes, uh, we have overtaken Mises, Ludwig von Mises have, have has overtaken Keynes since 2013 in, in interest in Brazil. And that's the only country I've run all the options, all the countries that Google Trends allow me to do. And Brazil is the only country in which Ludwig von Mises has more interest than John Maynard Keynes. Wow, that's quite an accomplishment. Congratulations on that. Um, now, it, I brought up Rusev. How did this this most weekend this most recent weekend protest go? Is is there actually a possibility of her being recalled? Uh, yeah, well, I would say uh, there is a possibility. Yes, it's an increasing uh, probability. I place the odds at uh, around thirty to forty percent uh, that she might be impeached by Congress. Uh, of course, uh, you you know that uh, uh, many members of her party, many politicians from different parties, part of the coalition in government, are being implicated and arrested uh, regarding corruption uh, related to the previously the largest uh, corporation in Brazil, not anymore, which is uh, Petrobras, a state-owned, state-controlled uh, oil company. Um, and uh, Rousseff, it's uh, up to this point, she has not been formally implicated by any of the witnesses of this, uh, of this um, trial, this process that resembles, by the way, very much the Italian uh, process back in the 90s, the uh, clean hands operation in, in, in Italy that resembles a lot because a lot of people are, are under arrest. Um, so it's because uh, the president was the chairman of the board of Petrobras during most of this time in which the corruption uh, uh, happened. And, um, and because also, apparently, uh, we we're going to have a final decision uh, by uh, the uh, relevant authorities, the relevant fiscal authorities, but ap apparently her government has uh, cooked the books in terms of fiscal accounts last year uh, to um, comply with the fiscal responsibility law, which, by the way, puts in prison every year about uh, 100 mayors <laughs> because they don't comply uh, with the fiscal responsibility law, they cannot run a, a deficit. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, the president and the finance minister have cooked the books last year, and this is under process. So because of these two um, issues, uh, there is an increasing probability that uh, Congress uh, may act on the president. But of course, as you know, the impeachment, and it's very similar to the U.S., is a political process run by Congress. And as you might recall, Jeff, a few years ago, we had another scandal called the Men's Salon, which is basically a, a month, monthly in, a, a stipend <laughs> scandal in which uh, it was revealed that uh, the executive branch was paying uh, all the members of the coalition in the House of Representatives to support the government. Uh, so uh, it's a complicated uh, process because, you know, of course, uh, the two branches of government in Brazil usually are in bed. So you, can, you cannot know. But because of the protests uh, and uh, because of all the public outcry, we, we suspect that uh, there might be developments there, but it's hard to hard to say exactly if it's going to happen. Well, as far as the economy goes, like America, Brazil's got some problems right now. There's actually a CNN Money article 
uh, that lists three particular problems with the Brazilian economy. I'd like to get a, a, an Austrian take from you on this. First and foremost is is a is an ongoing recession and what you know with your trading partner in China, uh, the Petrobras scandal, which you mentioned, and also the possibility of the U.S. Fed raising interest rates, which at least in theory would cause some money to flow out of uh, so-called emerging markets like Brazil. It, you know, what's the feeling? Does the man on the street have a, a really a, a bad sense of what's happening? And is this going to make the average Brazilian more Marxist or less? Yes, I think um, uh, the man in the street is feeling a lot because inflation has picked up dramatically. Because uh, let me just uh, do a quick review of what uh, happened in Brazil over the last 20 years or so. In 94, we uh, stabilized uh, the country in terms of public finances and inflation. Before that, we had crazy, insane fi fiscal management and, and hyperinflation. Uh, and that was based on three arrows, uh, which were... Uh, non-intervention in, in the exchange rate, uh, fiscal surplus, at least fiscal surplus before paying interest. So we had about 3% to 4% primary surplus before paying interest. And then we had about 6% of interest. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling about the percentage of the GDP, right? So we had you had about 6% of GDP in interest. So you would run a nominal deficit of around 2% because the country was growing a little bit more than that. You had a, a, a decreasing debt scenario, which was very good for a long time. And the third and the third arrow of that policy of stabilization was um, uh, inflation targeting, which actually helped a lot to control inflation. Over the last four years during the Dilma Rousseff um, 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 government. She basically tried to dilute all of, all of the three arrows, and, and then she started intervening in the exchange rate. She started uh, tweaking with the inflation uh, calculations and basically decreasing taxes on the products that were part of the basket of uh, of the inflation. Uh, so she was, and and of course controlling the what we called managed prices, which are basically the utilities in general, in which the government controls a lot of those prices, of, of the tariffs. So uh, using those tricks, she was controlling uh, in, the inflation numbers, the inflation index, but not in real inflation, as we know. And of course, she was spending a lot because the idea of gov of her government was that we had the 2008 when 2008 happened Brazil was pretty resilient at the time but the government decided to uh, implement counter cyclical measures and increase spending and increase credit so she basically diluted the three arrows and because of that we now have inflation of 10% a nominal deficit of 7% of gdp which is crazy. The trajectory of the debt is is uh, is exploding badly, uh, and and intervention in the uh, exchange rate up to about a few months ago. Now the real, which was worth around 2.3 reals to the dollar, it's now at 3.5 within a few months. So we had a huge devaluation, and of course part of that is ex explained by the. Uh, the dollar, which has uh, uh, become stronger since the Fed has announced the intention to raise interest rates. But all of this is uh, dynamite for the, the man in the street. He's uh, unemployed increasingly. He's suffered from inflation. And of course, he's very dissatisfied. Uh, the, the, the dilemma uh, is that uh, you know, usually the average Brazilian, the guy in the street, is a schizophrenic, because at the same time he understands, Jeff, that uh, you know taxes are really high. He wants less government, less taxes, less intrusion. But at the same time, he says that he wants the government to guarantee education, health, and some other things. And what's the the new development in Brazil is that uh, there is a growing section of the population which are influenced by libertarian and good conservative ideas and 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 of course as you mentioned uh, the leader in the movements in brazil is a is a hundred percent libertarian uh so because of this we are having an agenda which is being changed they're focusing now on the impeachment process 
But the good news is that behind the impeachment agenda, there is a good libertarian agenda that's ready to strike in as soon as the moment uh, arises. L.U., most Americans and most Westerners in general do not have a sense of what it's like to live with 10 or 15 percent price inflation at the store, for example. What do Brazilians do to protect themselves from this? Well, um, it's very complicated. In Brazil, we, because of the memory of inflation and because of the past of inflation, um, you, if you have savings, liquid savings, you, you can get protected because if you're sitting down right now, it's better because the interbank interest rates in Brazil are above 14 <laughs> percent. So this is crazy, right? You can make money. Uh, just having the the money sitting still in the bank. And in the U.S., I guess it's the opposite because you make zero right now in short-term investments and you still have an inflation of around 2%. So in Brazil, we have at least uh, real interest rates and the central bank is now trying to restore uh, inflation back to the target. Uh, let's see if that will happen, but at least they are raising interest rates. And they are now starting to try to control a little bit of the credit. Uh, so, uh, but getting back to your question, uh, the man in the street doesn't have any liquid savings. He suffers the full blow of inflation in rising prices. But people that have a little bit of liquid investments, yes, they can protect. In the US, we mainly hear about Brazil in relation to the so-called BRIC countries. And we hear a lot about Brazilian fiscal policy but we don't hear much about the Brazilian Central Bank. Can you just tell us a little bit about how the Central Bank in Brazil operates? Uh, the Central Bank of Brazil is completely state-owned. You don't have any uh, participation of regional uh, banks like, like you have in the U.S. Uh, you have the controlling stake of the central uh, government in the U.S. when you nominate most of the members of the, of the uh, FOMC. Uh, in Brazil, everything, 100%. Of our FOMC is uh, uh, government nominated, so it's fully central. Uh, but it works uh, in similar ways as the Fed does. Uh, the the different thing is the inflation targeting. We don't have a, we don't have a dual mandate here. They have to uh, uh, set the target and work within a two percent band up or down. The problem is. In the last four years, since the government started this counter-cyclical measures that they called, <laughs> they call it a new macroeconomic matrix. That's a very status name. Um, since they started that, they were not targeting the center of the band, the inflation band any longer. They were targeting the top of the band, which was six and a half percent. And now they... In the last two years, they disregarded even the top of the band. So the, the inflation is running above 9%, very close to 10%. But in terms of actual, uh, actually how the Fed works in Brazil, the central bank, it's very similar to the U.S. Well, do wealthy people in Brazil fear hyperinflation and do they keep a lot of their money outside of the country? And more importantly, do they fear capital controls on getting their money out of the country? They, we are not uh, fearing any longer the capital controls because of the large uh, international reserves that we currently hold around $370 billion, all in, t in treasuries, <laughs> most of it, at least. U uh, US, you mean US, US treasuries? US yeah. treasuries, yes. Uh, uh, so because of that, people are not fearing uh, capital controls. Uh, what they are really fearing and suffering is the massive devaluation of the real because of the inflation. And um, at least the central banks stopped the intervention. They were they sold around a hundred billion dollars of uh, d of dollars to try to control the exchange rate and swaps as well over the last eighteen months or so. They stopped doing that uh, a few months ago, and that's why the currency hit up to to track whatever the market uh, is. But since we still have this huge uh, international reserves, people don't fear the capital controls, no. Well, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to leave this conversation with one last question. What was the overall experience with the 2014 FIFA World Cup and you've got the upcoming 2016 Olympics? This seems like this is tailor-made for cronyism and corruption. Yes, uh, true. 
Um, you know, we have a, a few stadiums that uh, are no longer used uh, and that were, of course, um, very expensive, much higher prices than you would expect in the international market. So, of course, we have a lot of cronyism related to the World Cup, and that's a disappointment. And people uh, back in 2013, when the pro protest uh, began, they were they were talking a lot about that. Uh, and and this year, uh, now the protests are a little less about that and more towards less government in general and impeachment of the president because of corruption charges. Um, but of course, uh, the Olympics, I guess you have the same thing. I don't follow much of the Olympics uh, cronyism, but of course you have it. And I prefer not to read about it, otherwise I'll be depressed. <laughs> Elio, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not familiar with Mises Brazil, you should absolutely check them out. It's an organization that punches way above its weight. And Elio, just keep us informed as to what you're doing, and we look forward to seeing you in the very near future here in Auburn. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was great talking to you.